So for some time I've been interested in understanding um, the development of human, the dynamics of human capital. Um, this is um, a picture that is based on the CNLSY. Um, we follow here children from uh, basically the day that they are born up to, um, to the current day. Uh, so a lot of them are now 30 uh, years old. Some of them are even close to 40 years old. But until they are about age 14, you actually measure their uh, 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 cognitive and uncognitive skills. So this is based on um, a figure from uh, Carnier and Heckman. What you can do is look at uh, families that have high income for uh, long periods of time and uh, basically uh, follow the path of skills, cognitive skills of their children. And you can compare them with the path of the skills of the children who come from the poorest families in this data set. By age 14, what you're going to see is that it's about one standard deviation, the differences in the cognitive skills. If you go by age five, it's already close to one standard deviation. Um, there are issues here about the measurement, so um, it turns out that the data here is uh, not so good, but it seems to uh, uh, show some evidence that the, the differences are not so large early on. Um, you can go to the same data set and uh, basically look at, try to explain these differences by looking at how much investments children are getting. It's possible to look at uh, the uh, uh, quality of the environment. What I'm doing here is uh, factor analyzing the quality of the home envi environment by uh, putting two uh, data sets together, uh, the uh, CNLSY data set, but also the uh, PSID. Um, there is an advantage because the PSID has two components, uh, not only the home score, but also components of time that children get in terms of investment. So you can actually set the scale of the investment factor in terms of number of hours that they get, uh, in this case per day. What I'm plotting here again are uh, the children from the richest families in terms of how much uh, interaction they get. Um, if you look at uh, they're going to get about two hours per day. Um, that's the uh, mode right here. Um, but if you look at the ones that come from the poorest families, the, the mode doesn't even get one hour. Now, there is, what is interesting also is this large dis, uh, dis, uh, distribution, uh, this variability that you get across all of these different uh, uh, socioeconomic groups. Um, so how do we think about this problem? Basically, we have a choice set, which is a combination of a budget constraint and a production function of human capital that determines how we can trade off uh, child development with uh, household other expenditures. And we have preferences that tells us how, how we're willing to do that. Uh, so current approaches are we're going to move uh, these choice sets because of parental resources or we're gonna move these choice sets because different parents have different marginal productivities. Okay, so parents that are more productive, they're pushing this frontier out here. Parents that are less productive, they're pushing this frontier uh, down here. Okay, so what I'm saying is, well, this is the choice if they actually know the production function of human capital, um, except that there are a few stu studies that are challenging this notion. So one of them, for example, is a former Penn student who looked at data from Philippines and show that uh, a simple campaign of telling parents that if you actually have iodized, if, if your children consume iodized salt, that actually has consequences for brain development. Um, a simple campaign of informing parents about that actually led parents to adopt, uh, to uh, choose, uh, to be more likely to choose iodized salt, and then uh, the children uh, who got, uh, the parents who were affected by these, uh, by these information campaign their children were more able to exhibit better cognitive development. Similar, similar uh, finding in Tanzania uh, by uh, Erica Feud and co-authors. Um, uh, Anna Iser and uh, Laurie Stroud, ha uh, Stroud have a paper in which they uh, document uh, cigarette consumption by pregnant women right, after, right before and right after the release of the Surgeon General report. Educated women immediately reacted to the news and uneducated women didn't. Um, uh, Ariel Khalil and co-authors have a paper on uh, 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 time diaries looking at how parents actually uh, spend time with the children and they show that, for example, parents that uh, are more educated not only spend more time, uh, going back to this thing here, but also 
the way that they spend time is actually more appropriate for the development needs of the child. Okay. Uh, there are, more, uh, there are uh, more papers on health interventions. Uh, there is a, a, a paper in Brazil, a working paper in Brazil, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has never been published, but Brazil experienced in uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, very sharp reduction in child, uh, child uh, mortality. A lot of child mortality in Brazil was uh, caused because of uh, dehydration. So the government uh, had this major campaign that was on uh, newspapers, uh, TV uh, stations, uh, radio channels, uh, and also some component of home visitation telling uh, uh, parents if you actually uh, give uh, a little bit of uh, water with uh, uh, a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar, you can actually uh, undo a lot of the consequences of diarrhea, for example. Uh, so in that context, uh, what I'm going to talk today is what if they don't know the production function? What if they actually underestimate, for example, the impact of certain inputs in the development of the child? Well, in, in which case, even though this is the production process uh, the child developmental process is actually going to be determined by the blue line. That's the real, that's, that's what the uh, real production function actually is. If they believe, if they underestimate the components of uh, the, the return to these inputs, what they're going to do is to choose a point like this, not a point like this, because they believe that the return to investing is actually lower. Um, this is going to be a major identification power because you can actually explain the same thing by saying that parents are more or less, produ uh, more or less productive. So the explanations are uh, virtually the same. So what I'm going to try to, uh, what I'm going to do today is to say how I'm trying to actually measure these parental beliefs about the return to education, uh, about the return to uh, investments. So I'm going to uh, think of a very simple framework, the simplest that you can actually uh, uh, think of. This is going to be uh, the human capital of the child at age 24 months. Uh, this is going to be uh, the production function, where, where you're going to have some components, some uh, uh, parental productivity components uh, that parents know uh, at the time that they're making investments, some shocks that they don't know at the time that they're making investments. Here are the investments in the human capital of children. Here are the health conditions of the child at birth. And it's a simple Cobb Douglas production function. Turns out not to be too bad. Um, in previous work with uh, Heckman and Shannock, we actually could not reject for uh, early, early on uh, the uh, Cobb Douglas specification. Um, I'm going to show you some evidence that parents may actually not even believe that that's what the uh, tree specification is. So instead of assuming that parents uh, know gamma, what I'm going to uh, assume is that a mother has beliefs about gamma. And by, me, by this, I really mean that uh, gamma is going to be a random variable. I'm going to assume for now that it's going to be normally distributed. Gamma for each mother is going to be a normal random variable with mean uh, mu gamma and then variance uh, sigma two gamma. That's going to be specific to a mother. Each mother here has going to have a different mean and a different variance. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, let me... Actually, uh, uh, yeah. Actually, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot, not a lot, but a few, a few of the respondents say that uh, if you actually try to help the child by teaching them stuff, you are actually making them learn, uh, make them um, uh, uh, slow thinkers. I mean, I, 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 we did some of qualitative uh, findings because, because of some of the findings that I'm going to report. Um, uh, I'm going to mostly focus on mu today. I don't think that I'm going to have the time. I'm going to uh, just mention, but you're going to see that once I get mu, it's going to be a pretty uh, uh, similar um, uh, way of actually getting some notion about the variance. Uh, so I did, uh, when I started this project, um, I, 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 How important is the variance going to be in the... In the choice? Yes. Very important. But a different, different models will, allow, will uh, deliver different ways that the variance is going to affect. So if you have a learning model, that's actually going to say that parents are going to invest a lot if they have a high variance. If you now assume that parents uh, have these beliefs, that the beliefs are not changing as a result of their experience, then the variances are going to shrink the amount of investments that they have because it's going to make things more it's uncertain. supposed to be heterogeneity in beliefs Heter or no, in effectiveness so of... Oh, good, great question. I'm going to have, for each mother, I'm going to have a mu gamma i. 
I'm going to have a distribution of mu's across the population. Similarly, I'm going to have a distribution of variances okay. in the population. Okay, so, so that is the variance for one particular. Exactly. It's how she, how uncertain she is about the return she investments. Okay, but uh, but uh, but it dip so the what I'm saying today, the the mean, the impact of the mean on the decision of investments uh, is the same across whether you have a dynamic model or a static model, uh, and whether beliefs are changed or not, but not for the variance. Okay, so when I started this project, I. I I, started, I, had, I, had a, uh, uh, I knew a few people that were um, pregnant for the first time, and I started talking to them. And, um, a lot of them are actually associated with uh, uh, people at Penn, so they are either Penn uh, uh, faculty or uh, married to Penn faculty. And I started talking to them, and one interesting thing, they all live very close to each other, and they told me, oh, why don't you come to our group? Because we have a group that meets every week, and we exchange ideas and information about child development. I said, oh, that's exactly the group that I'm going to do my survey. Uh, and I did with them, and it was fantastic, because um, they, they were really uh, excited about uh, uh, answering the survey instrument. And they, uh, if anything, they actually exhibit uh, extremely high return to investment. So I was very confident that, that people would like to do this. But then, then I said, maybe I have a selected sample. Um, <laughs> so, so maybe I should, uh, uh, I should not be so happy. Um, so what, it, just, just an assumption, yeah. So then I went to the other end of the, uh, uh, of the spectrum. So I, I, so, so what I'm going to show you today is um, 200 data points, uh, analysis based on 200 data points, uh, and we're still collecting more data, about respondents that are really poor. All of them are in a Medicaid clinic. Um, about 72%, so mostly African American and Hispanics. 50% uh, of them are 21 years old or younger. 80% of them are uh, 24 years old or younger. Okay, so. Uh, very, very young set of uh, uh, mothers. Um, 20%, only 20% of them are actually married or cohabiting with a partner. Most of them are actually cohabiting with a partner. 80% uh, of them are single mothers. Uh, they, uh, they do live with uh, other household members, uh, other family members. Uh, and 56% of them are primiparous. Um, why did I choose that? First, it's because this is, this is a, group of a, a group of parents that are going to uh, be more likely to underinvest in their children. And second, um, I thought that uh, if, we, if they can't do this survey, uh, or then it would be a, a, a very difficult project to keep on working. So that's why I wanted to test with this highly uh, disadvantaged group of individuals. So, so what I'm going to show to you today, I'm going to skip through the, 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 the first part, which is going to be the objective estimation of the technology of skill formation. It's basically uh, looking, uh, applying just what we did with uh, Heckman and Shenak. Uh, two differences, though. One is that um, in that paper we had, uh, we discussed a lot the issue of metric, uh, how to uh, uh, come up with a cardinal measure of skills. Uh, what I'm going to do today is because I'm only going to look at skills up to age two, around age two, then I'm going to uh, construct a mental age of development. The way I'm going to do this is basically through an item response theory analysis of, of the, uh, of the uh, um, score that is used and available in the CNLSY. And the same thing is going to be for the uh, component of investments that I'm going to scale in months uh, of investments per year. So I'm, instead of looking at days, uh, hours per day, I'm just going to trans uh, transport that in months per year. So the dependent variable is a measure of stock, measured in months. The flow is actually, the investment is a flow of number of months of investment per year. Okay? So I'm, I'm basically going to skip through uh, the details. I, I won't have much time. But then I'm going to spend some time how to actually elicit these beliefs. Okay? Um, let, me, let me just do this. So, this is the problem that we faced. Uh, Cobb Douglas specification not so bad based on our findings. Uh, uh, here are the three problems that, you, that one has to uh, uh, find. One is the problem of the metric be, uh, uh, for skills and, uh, and investments. You have the problem of endogeneity, and then you have the problem measurement error in Q and X. Um, let me show to you the metric. The, 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 now, 
don't run away. <laughs> As a child psychologist, I know that uh, this is not uh, the child psychologist's favorite uh, measure of uh, child uh, development. Um, so basically, the uh, home, the, the way um, skills are measured in the CNLSY, it's a large study. There are about almost 12,000 children. Is actually by sending parents a, 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 an instrument uh, of child development, which is basically this. So one of the questions, for example, I'm going to focus a lot on this question. Has you, uh, so when the child is between 22 months and th uh, almost four years, uh, one of the questions that they ask is, has your child ever spoken a partial sentence of three words or more? And then the mom uh, uh, ch uh, checks yes or no. Um, there are certain skills that our parents find more difficult. They actually skip uh, in, the, uh, in the answer. Uh, what is really worrisome for, uh, for, uh, in a lot of analysis here is that Parents may not even recognize that the child has developed a certain skill. So that is why, even though a lot of some of the items come from the Bailey uh, uh, instrument, um, the problem is because it's actually not based on direct observation. Um, there is evidence that this is a full of measurement error. And I actually, when I drew the IRT analysis, I do find that it's really much more error prone than, uh, than I would like it to be. So, but if you drew that, what you're going to get, and this is going to be the parameter of interest, uh, uh, I'm focusing on, I would like to measure skills at age 24 months, except that the CNLSY doesn't visit people according to the age of the child. The schedule of the date of the interview is not related to that. Um, so you're go you, can, uh, you can try to make this as, um, this, uh, you can try to increase this, uh, a, a number of observations. If you do that, you're going to have to look at children that in, are anywhere between age 2 and 36 months. You don't want to go beyond age 36 months because th this is uh, ceiling effects on this test become really pronounced after age 36 months. Uh, but if you do that uh, and you have um, dummies for uh, age of the child at the date of the interview, you get a gamma that is about 10%. Uh, 10%. If you, instead of having uh, uh, dummies, and if you have just a log, uh, uh, control for log of the age of the child at the time of the, uh, the interview, you, you get something about uh, 0.12. As you now zero in on uh, age 24 months, you lose observations very quickly, but gamma doesn't change that much. It increases a little bit, but uh, the, so does the standard error. So there is not much evidence that things become so much worse after you, uh, after some much more different once uh, you start increasing. But if anything, I, you can think that gamma is any, anywhere between 0 0.10 or 0 0.16. And if you want to uh, maybe add two standard deviations, then this is going to be anywhere between 0 0.06 and then 0 0.25. Okay, so those are things that uh, you can think of that. But now, there's a huge falling off in the fit of the model as you get to older ages, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically what is that? because Why? well, basically because now uh, one of the things one of the things that is helping you in terms of uh, fitting the model is actually uh, the age dummies. They're explaining a lot of child development, right? So, so if you have a child that is six months old, sh she's not going to score as high as the child that is 15 months old just just by doing that. Uh, and here I am really reducing now the uh, uh, the age range. So I have ha here I have axes that are going anywhere from two to 36 months. Here my axes are going to between 20 to 28 months. So that's only the thing that it's going on. So, yeah. How important are the time dummies relative to your axes? Not very important. Uh, actually, I had a graph that showed that if you actually type, if you actually put the uh, time dum the month dummies and you uh, and the implied uh, 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 log uh, specification. They pretty much sit on top of each other. I can show. I have the figure. I can show it to you. It's so. This is a much more uh, uh, economical formulation, and it's very similar to uh, to, to 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 the more, more expensive one. Okay. So um, now, how do how do you elicit beliefs about the technology of skill formation? Uh, I'm going to have now three, uh, uh, actually four, uh, four different steps. So the way I'm going to formulate this, I want. I want to produce something that is as comparable as the data that I use to uh, estimate the objective function. So instead of asking, um, my instrument is, instead of asking the mother, has your child ever spoken a partial sentence of three words or more, I'm going to ask a, a, a mother who is sitting at a clinic, 
um, and she's pregnant, she's waiting for her prenatal visit. Uh, uh, most of them, the majority of them, are actually pregnant for the first time. Um, what do you think is the youngest age and the oldest age a baby le learns to speak a partial sentence of three words or more? That's, that's the question I'm going to ask them. Okay? Not so, your baby. Huh? Not your baby. Not, not, I mean, you, this a, is an important question. A baby. A, a, a baby. A baby. At a baby. Okay, You're fine. going to see that I'm going to worry the, about. The other question was a, your baby. Your baby. Right. You're going to see, yeah. Uh, so let me step back for a second for the issue of uh, information set. Because I'm going, I'm going to tackle that. Okay, so our goal is actually to measure the uh, uh, maternal expectation around, uh, at age 24 months. Uh, that's uh, that's the target age at the uh, measurement of the uh, uh, objective production function. So what I'm going to do is just going to inform uh, these age ranges. I'm going to transform it into probability statements. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to make the assumption that the development is uniformly distributed within the age range that supplies. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say that one mother says that uh, for that specific question, the, the youngest age is 18 months and the oldest age is 28 months. I'm going to assume that the age, the probability before age 18 is zero, the probability after age 28 is one, I'm going to interpolate. I'm going to look at where this crosses at age 24 months. I'm going to infer it's 60%. If another mother tells me that it's between 12 and 26 months, I'm going to repeat the same steps. I'm going to conclude that it's close to 90%. Okay, so that's how I'm going to do this. Yeah. So the expectations literally often ask percent chances of events. Happening. Yeah, I actually do that too, but there is an issue of framing that I'm uh, just starting to study uh, to understand. And, uh, and I asked that question. Uh, what is the, instead of asking them, um, this question here, I asked them, what is the percent chance, well, how likely is it that uh, the baby will learn to speak a partial sentence by age two years? Um, there is an issue of framing. I'm not going to discuss this. Uh, when I go to Arizona, I will. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here's the uh, situation. Um, now I need to transform that information, that probability, into a measure of expected human capital. Okay, so I'm going to go to a national uh, health and nutrition examination survey and look at uh, and look at uh, 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 child development because the the very same instrument was used in that study, and the advantage of that uh, data set is because it comp contains a representative set of uh, uh, children, each one of them uh, from age two to forty-seven months. Okay, so so if I go there. What the, uh, the uh, NHANES uh, will allow, give me are these blue dots. These are basically the fraction of children, let's say by age 12 months, that have learned how to speak a partial sentence of three words or more. I'm going to, I'm going to, estimate, this uh, I'm going to estimate this function. Okay? So now if the mom tells me that there's a 60% chance that the child is going to learn how to uh, speak a partial sentence of three words or more by 24 months, I'm going to come back here, I'm going to invert, and I'm going to conclude that that actually is equivalent to her expecting that by age 24 months, the child development will be in mental ages 20 months. So that is a gap, a four month gap in terms of uh, mental development. Okay. Are you conditioning this on, on race or ethnicity or anything else, or are you just using the entire data set? Let me, let me, let me, uh, uh, okay, so here I have 100 people uh, per bin. So I, I can't do this um, uh, very detailed analysis by demographic groups. Uh, I mean, uh, no, I meant in, 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 in the, here. Yeah. Here I have, at each age, I have 100 individuals. Okay, so within each age group, so I have 100 at age two months, 100 at age three months. Okay, so I don't have a lot of power to do the analysis that you would like to do, and I understand that there are differences, yeah. Okay, so, so but, but I'm going to try to show you that when I actually estimate the beliefs about the production function, that would not be so bad, okay? Now, if they actually, if a different one is no on age and sex, it turns out that children learn this task later, then they actually learn how to speak a partial sentence of three words or more. Uh, if she had said 60% for that question, that would, be, that would mean that she would expect the mental development at age 24 months to equal that of a 30-month-old child. But basically what you see in the data is something more like this. If the, test is more, if the task is more difficult, 
they assign a lower probability, and as a result, they're going to assign a number that is closer to 20 months. Now, this is going to tell me, uh, this figure tells me two things. If I want to look at, uh, uh, get rid of measurement error, I can take the average of these two things. And if I want to actually look at variance, I'm going to look at the deviation from expectation, uh, how large these, uh, be, uh, these differences are going to be across different tasks. Okay, so that's how it's going to be. Let me just show you this, because um, there are two things that I want to see uh, here. Uh, one thing is they do understand uh, that tasks that are more difficult, children should be not as likely to, uh, to, uh, to develop them. So if you look at, uh, I prefer to look at the uh, median uh, because the average is sensitive to, uh, uh, to, uh, to outliers, but it doesn't matter what you have, do. What I did here is to list the tasks from how difficult it is in terms of at age 24 months. So higher, these tasks here, 100% of children at age 24 months do them. Or down here, it's 88%. I have 23 of those tasks. A few of those, th the last one is only 3% of the children at age 24 months are actually able to do so. And if you actually now uh, look at the, uh, the pattern of the answers, is that yes, they do believe that these tasks here are less likely than, than as you go down, tasks become less likely to happen. But the other thing that you see very clearly is major underestimation of the child's capacity at age 24 months. I think that there is a large literature in child development that finds exactly the same things, all right? So, um, so, so, and large variability as well. So some parents are actually do report 100% uh, for these types of tasks, so not everyone is around the average. Okay. So in your, in your pilot uh, with your friends, uh, Pam, did you find also underestimation? No, 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 no. I, uh, you, you can, if you look at the median, no, not at all, okay? So um, if you had used a different distribution than a uniform, uh -huh. you might get the expected and the reality to be much, line up much more closely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't done yet, but some of, one of the things that I want to do is a, a series of different uh, uh, triangular distributions. I haven't done that yet, but it's something that I'm planning to do, yeah. Uh, and see, but you know, th this is not the first, I am not the first uh, to find uh, this type of finding. Um, and it also for the pilot, when I drew uh, with the high, uh, high education people, I do find qualitatively different results. Um, so, but this, well, okay, so each one of them, uh, so I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna have for the uh, estimation of the production function, I'm gonna use 14, uh, 15 different uh, 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 items, each one of them, I can think of them as an error read and estimate of maternal expectation uh, of child development just by reproducing these steps that I just did. Um, I'm gonna have K of such measures uh, and, I can uh, and I'm gonna tackle measurement er error, but uh, there is something else that I need to do before I do that, which is I am really interested in finding out what maternal beliefs about the parameter gamma is going to be. So uh, I need to make I need to be a little bit more specific when I ask parents uh, what uh, the question is going to be. More specifically, I'm going to show them scenarios about the child's health condition at birth, how much investment the parents are going to have, uh, are going to make, and then I'm going to infer, and then I'm going to assume that she has private information about the quality of the child, okay? So, so data I is, her, is something that she knows I'm not going to elicit from her. I am going to assume this, uh, that as I change the scenarios, she's, keep, she's uh, holding theta i constant. That's the issue of the uh, information set, okay? So how, what are the scenarios that I'm going to do? I'm going to have four scenarios. Um, I'm going to describe the scenarios to you. I'm going, different, uh, different uh, subjects received different uh, parameterizations of these scenarios. But four scenarios, one scenario is in, in which the child is healthy at birth and investment is high, another one, not healthy, investment high, healthy, investment is low, not healthy, investment is low. And there is a video that explains to the participants exactly what we mean by healthy versus not healthy, high investment versus low investment. Um, so, uh, so we really uh, make sure that whoever is answering an instrument is getting exactly the same uh, information. The video takes about five minutes, okay? Here is the, here's exactly the instrument that they're going to be showing. One instrument is going, uh, what, uh, so here is uh, what you think is the youngest age and the oldest age. A, a baby learns to speak a partial sentence of three words or more. 
Here are the four scenarios I described to you. What they're doing is that they're just moving these, these, these uh, circles here. And uh, uh, this was done by piloting because I realized that a lot of them, even though they don't have many things, a lot of them do have smartphones and they are very used to actually moving things on the screen. So uh, MKIDS is the Maternal Knowledge Infant Development Survey. Uh, they needed a catchy name. The doctors at the clinic told me that eliciting maternal information about the technology of skill formation was not very appealing. So, so let me show you Here, that, yeah. yeah. A slide a long time ago, I think oh. said that um, some parents will spend like two hours a day with their kid and others yeah. like half an hour a day. Yeah. Both of those numbers, three and four hours a day, seem high. Uh, so, okay, so good. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, this is the sixth decile of the uh, uh, child development survey uh, time use. Uh, this is the fourth decile in the distribution. What I showed to you were, were the modes of the distribution. So two hour is the mode for high income parents, a little bit le more than half an hour is the mode for low income parents. But if you look unconditionally, this is going to be the sixth and the fourth decile. But I'm gonna play with that for a second. You're going to see that, okay? So um, let me show to you that parents understand, that they understand that the production function is actually monotonic. So here you have scenarios uh, one and three. The child condition uh, uh, is both healthy. Here the child, uh, the investment is high. Here the investment is low. You can go across the 15 different uh, skills and you're going to see, I don't list all of them here, but you're going to see that they report that the child is more likely to uh, learn this task in the be better scenario than in the worst scenario. And you can do the same for the not healthy scenario. They're more likely to, to report uh, that uh, investment is, uh, when investment is high, the child is more likely to learn things than when investment is low. So they understand, I mean, we, some people do report that, um, and that happens especially for the situation in which the child is not healthy at birth, that if the investment is high, is actually there is a situation in which you're going to, if you move from here to here, you actually improve the child's chances of learning that. It's not a large group of people, but definitely there are those people. And the same people that say that uh, in this situation here, investment is actually detrimental to the child, they're going to say that in this thing here, the investment is actually not detrimental to the child. Okay. Um, so you want to test spontaneity within an individual, right? This is yeah. the average over the whole sample. This so is the average across the whole sample. Yeah. I don't know if this really tests spontaneity. Uh, I'm going to get, gonna get there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so health is viewed as something that is not changeable? Isn't it part of the in possible investment? Uh, I'm sorry? So uh, I, I guess health is a, a dimension they could yeah. think of possibly investing oh, and improving. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you kind of test that? Um, yeah. No, I didn't. I, I, how is it framed? Is it framed in such a way that this is some kind of permanent characteristic? Uh, it, it's in, 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 the, um, in the video it is framed like this is a baby that was born this way. Okay. I wish I had not done that because one of the things that I learned is that um, a lot of the uh, respondents, we, a lot of the respondents actually never show up for prenatal exams. Um, and a lot of them who actually show up, uh, doctors tell us, you know, we, keep, we have to keep reminding them not to smoke and yet when they come to the clinic, we can see that they just smoked. Um, so I wish I had done that, but I didn't. Um, uh, we are planning to do that on a follow-up study that we're going to do, uh, but not to this one here. So that, I really thought about that as, you know, let me think of, a, uh, of the health condition of the child as given, but I think that it's interesting to also look at what they believe, how much they can affect the health condition of the child at birth by giving to the prenatal exams, by not smoking, by not drinking, things like that. I didn't do that. I'm, very sorry that I, that I didn't. But so I'm going to have for each one of the uh, uh, item for each M I MSD uh, item for each scenario, I'm going to have an error ridden estimate of conditional development at age 24 months. I'm going to call this uh, error ridden measure is this uh, long guy here, and then what I am really interested in is this uh, maternal expectation, and I'm going to treat this as a, a as a, a latent unobserved uh, variable. Okay. So, um, so uh, the component here is that you're going to have uh, you're going to have to make some assumptions about uh, 
things that you can uh, that you need to normalize. Then, then this is a factor model after all. So, but uh, basically, what I want you to think is, I have this uh, component here that I am interested in. I'm going to have measurement error that is going to be specific for an MSD item. You can think that uh, some items are going to be more difficult for models to uh, give an answer than others. This measurement error component is going to capture that. And I'm going to have an uh, allow for, for a measurement error that is specific to the scenario. So maybe they don't understand the scenario explanation for certain scenarios as well as the others. And then an, uh, an uh, uh, idiosyncratic component that is going to be uh, IID, uh, not IID, but independent across uh, K and J. Okay. So, um, so obviously, long literature on this uh, thing. I'm not going to get into that, but you can identify the distribution of this guy. Okay. Um, I think that is, I, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, let me just show to you something about measurement here. But wait, uh, I mean, you, have, you. This is on your sample of 100, though. This is a sample of 200. 200, okay. Yeah, but 200. It's still, well, I have 15 There's a questions. lot of parameters there, and I'm just I, curious. Yeah, I have 12,000 observations. Because they, each one of them answer 15 questions. Each 15 questions has four scenarios. So I have 60, each person gives me 60 answers, and I have 200 of them. So I have 12,000 observations. Okay, but I, so you're fitting it per person, though? I mean, you actually can construct observations. Yeah an analysis for each individual. I can't construct an analysis for each individual. You're going to assume some constancy across the different questions, some parameters that are the same. Yeah, yeah, I have to do that. Because even with this very partial uh, uh, parameterization, you already have 230 parameters. So it's a lot, a lot of parameters that start uh, uh, increasing very fast. In particular, for example, I'm not going to allow for factor loadings here. I could, could identify them. Or here, I could also identify them. But it's just that uh, it, it grows very fast, the number of parameters. So let me talk a little bit about the different scenarios. So healthy, uh, by a healthy scenario, uh, here, I'm going to mean, and, I'm, gonna, and you're going, uh, I'm going to come back to this, a child that is born after nine months, gestation uh, 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 lasted nine months, the child is about, uh, uh, seven points, uh, seven pounds at birth, and the child stayed uh, at most three days at the hospital after birth. Not healthy means uh, pregnancy lasts uh, seven months, uh, the child is born uh, and the weight is five pounds, and the child stays for seven days at the hospital after birth. Okay, uh, Four hours of investment versus three hours. What I mean by normal is basically, uh, one of the things that I was really worried is that um, the findings here were a little bit shocking to me, and maybe I thought this is because of the, using the words healthy versus not healthy. So normal is exactly, is very close to what I mean by healthy, except that instead of uh, using hospital anywhere, I said that the child is actually, um, uh, is about 20 inches long at birth. And small is a child that is very similar to normal. Eight and a half weeks pregnancy, uh, eight and a half months pregnancy, 19 uh, inches instead of 20 inches, and, uh, and the weight is uh, uh, seven, uh, uh, almost seven, I think that this is the weight here is eight pounds, here the weight is seven pounds. Four versus three hours. Then healthy versus not healthy, basically the same but not using the word hospital. Uh, then six hours versus two hours. Now this is the ninth decile, this is the first decile. This is the first, this is the first decile in the, the conditions of the child at birth. This is the uh, a median, okay? So, so I'm, going, I'm going across uh, scenarios that are very close to each other, uh, normal versus small, very close to each other, then uh, two scenarios in which these guys here are, are much further away, and scenarios in which these are closer, but these are uh, further apart, okay? So what is the fraction? And you can do this for each one of the 15 measures. I'm not gonna sh you know, show all of them for you, but uh, you can see that uh, what is the fraction of variance that is actually due to maternal, uh, to, uh, maternal expected human capital? It's about a third, so a lot of measurement error. Most of the measurement error is because of item-specific measurement error. Almost nothing, uh, especially for these scenarios here, nothing is due to uh, scenario-specific measurement error. And then uh, another third is because of the uniqueness. Okay? Thank you. Uh, so you can go across these scenarios. What you're going to find is uh, these uh, both, uh, both formulation one or formulation three tend to be the one that have the highest amount of information. I think that this is so close together 
I collapse the information so that uh, the norm and the small behavior are so close to each other that it becomes much more, much more difficult for models to actually think of these different scenarios. Um, so uh, so why, why am I saying that? Well, because now I'm going to estimate mu gamma by looking at the, I'm gonna look at, for example, health differences be, uh, uh, in the healthy scenarios. I look at what, what she believes uh, child development is going to be if child is healthy, investment is, he is high, versus child is healthy and investment is low. Or if child is unhealthy, investment is high, child is unhealthy, investment is low. So you can do that. Now this comes to what a, a little bit more about the, the distributional impacts. So if you look at uh, the first one, healthy versus not healthy, four versus three hours, then uh, the median, remember that it's something, the objective estimate, estimate is somewhere between six and 25. Um, the median is about 5%. Um, here, here's the situation in which you're gonna have people actually, some of them reporting low uh, uh, negative returns. Then negative returns arise because of the not healthy scenarios. Um, so the, if you look at the median, so you're gonna have a distribution, it's a large distribution. But if you're gonna have, look at the healthy scenarios, individuals, uh, mothers tend to report much higher uh, returns to investing in that case. If you look at not healthy scenarios, the, the median person believes that there is nothing you can do, at least for this, uh, for this specification here. And uh, uh, higher returns for motor development items than if you look at the cognitive development items. So now if you go to normal versus small, what you're gonna find, again, much higher, uh, much higher uh, returns to investments that's uh, saying something about the word hospital um, I, 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 to some extent, uh, but also a lot more variability. And a lot of it, we know it's because of the issue of measurement here. Um, and if you look at healthy versus not healthy, six, six versus two hours, then things become more stable. Here, you would, not, here you would reject a Cobb-Douglas specification. You would actually find that if you allow for a CS specification, you would find that this is a lot of complementarity between health conditions at birth and, uh, 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 and, and, and investments. Um, not here, so here it's much closer to a Cobb Douglas. I believe that this is because it's easier for moms to actually think of very different scenarios of two hours versus six hours, um, but we're still working on that. Uh, another one that is in the field is the situation in which the mom is only healthy, but then we ask them, it's uh, four scenarios of only numbers of hours, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. I don't have the uh, results for that yet. So I'm done. Okay, so. Um, oh. Leave one for questions? oh, okay, so yeah, so let me stop it. The, the only thing that I, I'm going to say though is that the variance, the variance, uh, the variance is so small that if you actually looked at looked at a deviation from uh, zero point, let's for example, 0 0.05 minus 0 0.12 divided by the maternal variability, you would be for most people more than three standard deviations, uh, the difference between 0 0.05 and 0 0.12. So that's all that I'm going to say. So not only they have low beliefs, but they have, they are very certain that they, be, they have the right beliefs. So. We have uh, time for one, possibly two questions. Are there any, just in terms of these numbers, do you have any <coughs> variations by, I mean, these are all disadvantaged people. But they're not all disadvantaged. Oh, they're they're not equally disadvantaged. I'm just wondering, among the less disadvantaged, uh -huh. do you find something closer in the sense of, you know, getting closer to what you think is the truth here? In this? So, so what you get is, uh, the one thing that you can um, immediately see is uh, pregnant women tend to have better information and then, um, Married women also tend to have uh, better, better returns, uh, higher returns. Uh, yeah, pregnant, uh, well, married. Married and then women who, are, who have already had children. Okay, so uh, they are not, uh, that's not the first child. So they tend to have uh, higher uh, beliefs. But they're still below? Uh, no, they, no, the married women are actually high. Uh, are high. I'm just wondering, are they still mm -hmm. off target? Is what I'm no, 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 no. They are okay, not so off target. They are so then you can actually get learning by, by, I by think that there is, the child. I, I think that there is some component of learning, that they are doing this. But the, I don't know because, the, the, you know, I mean, this is a little bit of a selected sample of married women because they are also very few. So I, uh, so, um, I think that... Um, but single women who have had children aren't? I mean, they've had a child already. Yeah. I mean, this isn't a hypothetical anymore. 
Th that, for them, that's not hypothetical. Well, right. what do you mean it's not hypothetical? Well, they, they actually have some experience. They have some experience. With one event. Yeah, and then you do find, what you do find, for example, uh, across the board is, for example, they have better, uh, they have higher expectations in terms of when the children are going to learn the tasks. Right. No doubt about that. Um, also, they have a slightly higher uh, return to uh, investing in children. Uh, that's no, no doubt about that. We, all, I, we also asked a lot of questions in terms of uh, information. So where do you get information? Um, then it turns out that people that um, uh, uh, read a lot of child books also tend to have higher return, high beliefs about the returns. Um, and uh, parents who read about uh, uh, parental magazines also, but not people who get information from TV, not people who, who get information about child development from radio. Uh, those people don't necessarily have higher returns. Okay, just following up that question, in terms of the belief structure, how much is it in terms of the conditioning on what the outcome was for the previous child? Mm -hmm. So that you have an experience, you know, maybe you had a bad experience yeah. or a good experience, how much would this affect you and your expectations? Yeah, so we didn't ask any question about the existing child. Okay, uh, um, uh, my plan was only to measure only with women who are pregnant for the first time. Um, and we changed, the, uh, we changed the mind because we wanted to see if there, were, there would be some evidence in terms of learning. Uh, it wasn't clear that we would have, but we do find some evidence for learning, yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much.